Hi, students, and welcome to today's live IELTS class. My name is Adrian, and I'm streaming to you live from beautiful Budapest here in the heart of Europe. I hope everybody has had a fantastic week so far. In this class, we are looking at some IELTS questions and answers about the IELTS exam. Uh, this class is presented to our members. They're able to join the chat. Of course, everybody is welcome to watch. If you'd want to become a member of our channel, just click the join button beside the subscribe button. If you don't see it, you can send me an email. Hi, Exton. All right, while we wait for some more members to join in the class, a little bit about us. For those of you learning for the academic IELTS exam, please visit us at aehelp.com. And for the general IELTS modules, please check us out at gieltshelp.com. That's generaliltshelp.com. I'll show you really quickly what we're talking about here. This is our academic IELTS web portal with the blue background at aehelp.com. You can click that big red button to access your My Student account at the top here. Once you do that, you get a tour of all of our contents, uh, including computer-based exams, a full online course, uh, exams in PDF format, workbooks, study plans, over 100 hours of HD lesson videos with myself and other teachers as well, IELTS audio CDs, and lots more. So check that out. General IELTS students, same idea with the green background, gieltshelp.com. Click that big red button to join there. Hi, Ferdobs. Hi, Gunkai Ren. Again, this is a question and answer session as we've done in the past. Um, so uh, prepare your questions, any question uh, about the IELTS exam you can ask of me and I will happily give you the answer to the best of my ability. Uh, again, students, you can get our apps, Academic IELTS Help and General IELTS Help from your Google Play and Apple App Stores. For new members or for people who want to become members but don't know how, uh, send me an email, adrian, A-D-R-I-A-N, at aehelp dot com. Yeah, it's done. I see your question. I will discuss it in just a moment, okay? All right. Uh, so, students, uh, just before we get into those Q&As, the questions and answers, uh, an important reminder about the schedule from today until February 9th. Um, today we have this question and answer session. Then we will have a speaking part three where everybody can chat and participate. That's in about 90 minutes. And then no classes from the 31st to the 5th. I'm out of my office, so there's no classes until the 6th. 6th of February, I will be back with speaking part one at 15 o'clock Central European time. Okay, hi Amira. Nice of you to join in. Again, question and answer session, so students, get your questions ready. Okay, um, let's do this. So uh, first question is coming from our member, Yextan. Yextan. Um, Yextan says, I don't know the structure of the conclusion. Uh, Yextan, I'm guessing you're talking about task two because um, you have a conclusion in task two and a summary in task one. They're not the same. Okay, so task two, conclusion. Uh, task two, conclusion. That's a very good first question, Yextan, because there are a lot of students uh, who are confused about what the conclusion is in task two. Okay, so interestingly, the first point I want to tell you here is the conclusion is not just a repeat or a paraphrase of the introduction. It is more. Okay. All right. Um, I believe, if you give me a second here, Yextan. Uh, Let 
Yeah. All right. Let's uh, let's take a look at this. Um, yeah. So maybe uh, our viewers, members, uh, recall a class that we just did earlier uh, in this week. Doctors agree that for a long time, uh, for a long healthy life, people need to do at least 20 minutes of cardiovascular exercise. Uh, whereby they increase their heart rate, such as running or swimming. Even though most people know this, they do not do a regular cardiovascular activity. In your opinion, what are the reasons for this and how can this be changed? Uh, for Dov, Zyakstan, Amira, Gunkai Ren, do you remember this uh, question about uh, cardiovascular exercise? Hopefully. So we wrote the essay for this, and um, we're just going to look at the introduction, okay? So here was the introduction. Humans are born to move. That's your hook. And then the background. Background is your definition of what you're writing about and why it's important. So the topic. Most people know that 20 minutes of aerobic exercise to elevate the heart rate and work up a sweat lead to strong immune system, healthy lifestyle, and longevity. Although this is common knowledge around the world, many individuals do not regularly participate in such activities like running, swimming, or biking, and this results in poor health and illness. So stagnation is a concerning matter. From my perspective, the main reasons people avoid cardiovascular exercise is because they are either too busy or too lazy. I think the solutions for these are prioritizing exercise as the most important and finding partners for the added motivation. So this is my thesis. This is what my essay will contain in the body paragraphs. Okay. All right. So here is the conclusion. Yeah, it's done. Okay. We wrote the essay. Uh, we wrote body paragraph. Uh, one about prioritizing exercise uh, as uh, being very important. Uh, and then uh, we wrote the second paragraph about people who are too lazy and maybe finding some people to do exercise with to make it more interesting. So here's the conclusion, Yakstan, and I'll explain this. Okay. So the first part of the conclusion, Yakstan, is your main points paraphrased. Okay, so this is where you have a bit of paraphrasing. So remember, Yextan, that the two um, uh, points were busy schedule and lazy, so too busy, too lazy. So here we have busy schedule and laziness. Okay, a little bit of paraphrasing there. Okay, now here notice that I'm emphasizing these points with most common excuses, right? So here, I tell my reader that, in my opinion, indirectly, when people don't exercise because they say that they're too uh, busy or that they're lazy, that's an excuse. Okay, notice how I didn't mention that in other parts of my essay. So here, I'm adding a little bit extra, not a new idea, but kind of a stronger opinion. Okay, and... Um, then here, okay, so I restate my argument strongly. Okay, so here I say, nevertheless, I strongly believe these negative perspectives can be overcome with scheduling and socializing. So remember the solutions we're prioritizing and finding people to work out with? So there's a little bit more paraphrasing here with scheduling and socializing. And notice that I use this qualitative word, strongly believe. Okay. The idea for a good conclusion is that when you write an essay with a nice introduction, and some strong body paragraphs that convince your reader, that make your reader believe what you say or what you write, 
then in the conclusion, you can be a little bit stronger with your words. The basic idea is, hey, look, I spent 200, 250 words convincing you of my idea. Now, in the conclusion, you should believe me. So I'm going to be a little bit stronger. And hey, if you don't believe me, that's your thing. I'm finished my argument. Okay. Does that make sense so far for Dov's Gunkai Ren, Amira, on the idea of the conclusion? So what a conclusion's purpose is in this kind of a persuasive essay? Okay. So I restate my argument strongly in the conclusion, right? And then my very last part of my conclusion, and this is extremely important, arguably this sentence is the second most important sentence or sentences after the thesis. It's your take home message. Okay, and for a persuasive essay, this take home message is really important. It's like, okay, I read your paper, I read, I spent valuable five minutes of my life to read your ideas, read your argument. What do I get? What are you giving me? What do I get from this, right? That's your take home message. So here, my message for this essay is at the end of the day, regular cardiovascular exercise leads to more energy, time, and enjoyment. So here, I'm basically saying to the reader that, hey, maybe you want to think about this, all right? Maybe you want to start working out that 20 minutes a day because the saying that you don't have time or saying that you're lazy is actually, uh, ironically, the opposite of what you really get when you work out. When you work out, you can have fun, you can make time, and you can gain energy. So think about that the next time that you want to be lazy or the next time that you want to say you're too busy with work or school, okay? So that's my take home message. So the conclusion, again, it's not just a repeat of the introduction. Now, one really important point, okay, is that the conclusion should not introduce a new idea, all right? So <clears throat> the conclusion is not just a repeat or a, praise, uh, a paraphrase of the introduction. The conclusion is your points par paraphrase. So I'm going to kind of do this in step by step. So one, your thesis points paraphrased, your argument strengthened, and three, your take home message. Okay, now one kind of caveat, so one point that you have to be careful about is be careful not to introduce a new point in your conclusion which cannot be easily understood from the essay, okay? That's one of the very common mistakes uh, that many students will make and that leads to confusion for the reader is uh, people will write some kind of a, a sentence that's not explained in the essay and the reader kind of goes, what? Is this a, a new idea? Um, I'll think of one here for you. So. Uh, let's say I had some kind of a sentence like regular cardiovascular exercise also leads to lower uh, cholesterol and uh, blood pressure. Okay, something like that. I'm just giving you an example here. So this uh, kind of a sentence would not be a good idea to put into your conclusion because it's not explained in the essay. 
and there you actually will lose marks, especially if you do that in university or college. Your professor will put a red circle around it and say this information is not explained in the paper. Okay. All right. Um, so that was a really, really good question, Yekstan, about the conclusion. Uh, any other questions about the conclusion for task two? That's a very important question. So any more questions about that? Okay. Any questions about that? And I see, Amir, your, your question there. I'll get to it in just a second. Okay. So, yeah, so, um, okay, no, it's clear, good, Yextam. All right, so Amira is asking, uh, sir, sometimes uh, ideas come to mind while I'm writing the essay and I find them better. What should I do at this moment? Don't use them, Amira. That's what you should do. So Amira's question is, um, if I get some good ideas. I'm guessing you're thinking, Amir, like new ideas, okay? Um, while you're writing, what should you do? If I get some good ideas while writing the essay, what should I do? All right. Um, the answer, Amira, is nothing. Uh, do not in randomly include them. And I've seen this, Samir. I've seen students do this, and the essay looks kind of bad uh, when, um, when students uh, suddenly include an idea because they go, oh, that was such a good idea, and then they start writing it. But it actually makes the essay bad uh, if you jump around with ideas. So nothing, do not randomly include ideas, no matter how good they might seem. Okay, uh, of course, Amira, to avoid that, you want to uh, plan early and make sure you have good ideas. That's why you want to spend extra time on your thesis, okay? So this is the reason you should spend more time during planning your introduction and thesis so you avoid this okay that's why a little bit of planning there's a saying a little bit of planning goes a long way so Amira really focus on getting those good ideas before you start writing okay so a little bit of planning goes a long way a long ways okay so uh, do not randomly include them. Now, of course, Amira, in university, if you're writing a university paper, that's when you check yourself and rewrite, okay? So in college and university, if you write, 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 and suddenly you go, oop, I think I just got a much better idea, then it's time to go back, revise, and rewrite, okay? Okay, so revise your papers with the best ideas. Uh, the IELTS, you don't have enough time, Amira. So you have to, once you've decided your thesis, Amira, and you've started writing and you've developed your first body paragraph, there's no more turning back. You're committed. You have to stay the course, okay? All right, I think I saw a couple more questions there earlier that looked interesting. So I'm going to hop back a bit. Uh, Gunkai Ren, feel free to throw out some questions as well. Okay. Uh, so Yextan is also asking, uh, I'm good at listening, but sometimes I'm unable to hear some words.
What should I do? I think that's your question. Yextan. Um, this is where visualization is extremely important, Yextan. So uh, it's very, very difficult for any person to actually um, hear uh, all the words that are spoken or that are in the audio. So visualization and context help us, okay? Uh, this is why uh, you must focus to visualize the information as much as possible and practice this at home. So you can uh, infer the missing words from context. Okay, that's all you can do. So if you didn't hear it, if it wasn't clear, it's gone, Yextan. You can't turn back time. The only step that you can take is visually see the information, use the questions to help you, and then try to think what could that word be that I missed there. Okay, hopefully it's not a subject word or something like that. All right. Okay, um, Charlie Sen has a big question okay uh, Charlie uh, Sen is asking when do I use a comma and when do I use a semicolon in writing okay that's a big question Charlie, okay, and um, students, unless you're going for a band 8.5 or a band 9, uh, you don't need to worry about semicolon use, okay? You definitely need to know how to use a comma. Commas are much more common in the English language, okay? Uh, semicolons are less common you only need to worry about that if you're going for a really high band score, like a band 8.5, band 9, all right? And I'll tell you a little bit more about it. So for commas, there are basically 12 rules, okay? So there are 12 uh, common <laughs> comma rules that you should n learn, okay? And this is important this is important for a band 7 or more or even 6.5 or more on the IELTS exam okay so uh, Charlie check it out I just used the semicolon here, okay? Um, so <clears throat> what you have to know about uh, comma, semicolon, period, okay? So comma equals half stop. Yeah, let's go back here. Um, Semicolon. Sometimes people will say quarter stop, half stop, full stop. I say half stop, semicolon, two thirds stop, and um, period is full stop. Okay. Let's do it like that so it's sensible. Yep. Let's make that a little bit more simple to understand. Okay. So uh, in reading, when you see a comma, it's a half stop. It means you stop for about a half a second. Uh, when you see a semicolon, it's basically a combination of a period and a comma together. Uh, it's a two-thirds stop, so you stop a little bit longer than you do for a comma, and then the period is a full stop. You stop the longest when you read a period. 
Now, why is that important? Because that also indicates the way that you're joining information, okay? Um, so think about it this way. For a comma, the information is closely connected or related, okay? For a semicolon, the information is relevant but not clearly connected. For a period, the information is unique or different. Okay, not completely, I don't want to say that, but the information is not connected. Okay, so uh, I'll explain this to you with a couple examples real quick, Charlie, and then that'll make more sense, okay? So um, let's put a sentence before your answer here. So uh, both Yextun and... Charlie asked uh, questions about writing. One was the first was regarding the conclusion and the second uh, was concerning punctuation okay so notice my comma use here okay there's no semicolons it's all just commas why because they're very closely related ideas so both Yextun and Charlie ask questions about writing okay so we're talking about two subjects here two students asking questions about writing comma the first was regarding the conclusion. So here, what I'm doing is I'm using the comma to define writing, okay? Defining writing by the conclusion, because conclusion is a part of writing. And the second was concerning, here I have another comma because I'm adding another uh, phrase to the sentence, was punctuation. And I'm staying with just a comma because, again, we're still very tight and closely related to the concept of writing, okay? So there um, I have a very strong relationship with the idea of writing and so I'm using simply just commas to connect those tightly connected or related phrases, okay? Now I might write a sentence like this, okay, let me move this down. I know that punctuation is a big challenge for many students, including native speakers, so you really do have to practice it a lot, but once you get the hang of it, it, become, it does become easier, I promise you, okay? Uh, so both Yextun and Charlie asked questions about writing. They are outstanding and inquisitive students, okay? Um, so here, I'm giving you a little bit of a different sentence, okay? So both Yextan and Charlie ask questions about writing, semicolon, they are outstanding and inquisitive students. So here I'm talking about the nature of Yextan and Charlie as being good and curious students. Here I can use a comma, although it's not completely necessary, sometimes it's subjective, okay? Because both outstanding and inquisitive are related and they describe Yextun and Charlie. However, I need a semicolon here because first I explained to the reader that they asked about writing, then I'm still talking about the two students, but I'm no longer discussing writing. 
So it's a related but different idea. Does that make sense? So when the ideas are related but different and you wish to express them in the same sentence for some reason, that's when you use that semicolon. Does that make sense? Okay, I'm spending a little bit of extra time here because I really want you to kind of grasp this concept. You don't need to know semicolon use all that well for um, the IELTS exam, but you definitely need to know it for college and university. Okay, so um, Charlie, if you're still with us, because it was your question, I see that for Dobbs and Gunkai and Yekstan are like, oh, okay, I get it. Um, yeah, Amira, Amira makes a good point. So Amira says it isn't as easy as it looks. Uh, and that's right, Amira, it's not. It does take practice. Even coming up with uh, sample sentences like this takes a little bit of thinking on my part. So I make it look easy, but it takes a bit of practice, certainly. Okay. All right. Um, I do believe, just uh, bear with me a moment here. So at aehelp.com and gileshelp.com, uh, there is a blog, okay? So when you're in your My Student account, just darken this up a little bit, um, you're in your My Student account, above your uh, profile where you can edit your profile, there's a blog, okay? If you click on that blog, and you can do this as a free student, even if you're not a premium student, you can look at the uh, blog. And there's the first one right there, actually. So uh, I really, really highly uh, recommend um, looking at this. Uh, notice this very first blog that I've just uh, opened it up to. IELTS task one and two using commas, 12 rules to follow. So you check that out. Yeah, Rajveer, exactly. You can show contradiction with semicolons because, again, it's related but different, right? So related but different, okay? So if you go to read more on that blog, then um, here you have uh, rule number one of using the comma, okay? And then, uh, of course, you have all of the other 12 common rules, and um, it gives you an example for each one as well, okay? So definitely check out that blog. There's lots of sample task two essays in the blog as well. So lots of goodies there in the blog. Check that out. All right. Everybody pick that up. Okay. So yeah, and uh, again, uh, Rajveer is making a good point. Rajveer is saying, hey, I think you can use a semicolon to show contradiction. Yeah, you'll often see it with the word however, Rajveer. Uh, that's because when you're showing contradiction, it's two related but different ideas, okay? Um, Amira is asking, what if I used a comma instead of a semicolon? In many cases, it's possible, Amira, but in some cases, it's awkward, okay? Uh, sometimes you can use a comma instead of a semicolon. Sometimes you can use a period. So a comma is, a semicolon is a kind of a, um, it's a subjective choice of the writer. So I could do this here, okay? I could do that, where I say both Yexton and Charlie ask questions about writing, full stop. They are outstanding and inquisitive students. I can do that, but as the writer, I can choose to increase the flow or the speed of my uh, reader and change it to a semicolon. Both Yexton and Charlie ask questions about writing, they are outstanding and inquisitive students. Okay, so it's the flow of writing. We're talking about very advanced writing skills here, students, with this kind of punctuation. So again, for those of you who are aiming for band seven, not necessarily band nine, don't worry too much about semicolons, okay? I, I recommend not worrying too much for the IELTS about that, only for college or university, okay? All right, let's go to some other uh, questions because we could talk about commas and semicolons all day long. All right. Um, yeah, Preeti, I'm going to I'm going to leave the colon semicolon <laughs> question for another time. I did a class on that not so long ago 
And I believe there's a blog on the colon semicolon, but there, if there isn't, I'll create one, okay? Because that's a whole nother bag of goodies, the colon semicolon. So let's leave that one for now, okay? Uh, colons are usually when you're creating a list or a lengthy clause, uh, Preeti. That's the short answer, okay? All right. Um, there were some other good questions that were being asked, so I want to go back to some of those. Okay. Prachta uh, Yadav says, Sir, I find uh, matching headings difficult. Okay. Let's look at that one for a moment. So, question. What is the best strategy for matching a list of headings in reading? Question. Okay. That's a good one. I think a lot of students struggle with that one. There is a very, very clear strategy for that. Okay. Let me find you an example here real quick of a matching headings. Uh, let's go to page 52. Okay. So Okay. All right. Matching headings. So, here we go. All right, some very clear steps for uh, list of headings type questions. Okay, switching gears a little bit. Okay, um, so list of headings questions, you'll notice something interesting. First of all, it's the only question that's given to you before the passage because they want you to read that before the passage, okay? So, <clears throat> answer, uh, strategies. So, this is the only question that is given before the passage because the IELTS test makers want you to read this question before the passage. even if there is some extra or false information. So it's the only question that has some extra false information which you should read before you read the passage. There's a very good reason for that, okay? So that's number one. Number two. These headings are always paraphrased from the paragraphs, so you should paraphrase them when you read them as much as possible. Also, you should not, not, not try to skim read for these as they are paraphrased. Okay, so skim reading scanning is not a very good strategy for list of headings because the heading uses different words than the paragraph. So you're not going to able, you're not going to be able to match up the same words, okay? Uh, number three, these headings answer the what is this paragraph about question, not details, okay? So, Let's take an example here, and then it's going to make sense, all right? Um, so, uh, violent eruptions, magma, lava, and new islands 
Uh, what's one way to paraphrase this? So if I'm reading this, I skim read this before the passage, violent eruptions, magma, lava, and new islands. Uh, how can I say that in my own words in another way? Okay, keep it simple. All of you can paraphrase this. Violent eruptions, magma, lava, and new islands. What's a really easy, it's one word, okay, to paraphrase all of those words in a simple way. Can anybody think of that word? What are we talking about here? Visualize it. Yeah, very good. Rajvir says it's a volcano. Okay. So it's a volcano or a volcanic eruption. Very good. Okay. All right. Um, so basically you go through, you paraphrase them like this. Okay. The destruction of Pompeii. Now, if some of you know, Pompeii is a city. Okay. So the end of a city would be the paraphrase. Two continents become many. Uh, to land masses divide, okay? So just like that, you're going through and you're paraphrasing, okay? Now, um, here we go. Here is your strategy for the list of headings, questions that will work every single time. Let's jump to paragraph C. Okay, so let's read this one together. We'll do two of them, okay? So let's read this together. Initially, Pangaea divided into two parts named Laurasia and Gondwana. Laurasia consisted of what is today North America, Asia, and Europe, whilst Gondwana comprised modern-day South America, Africa, and Australia. These supercontinents eventually split apart further resulting in today's continental configuration. It is interesting to note that today's continental alignment is just that. Millions of years in the future, the Earth's continents will appear very different. Given enough time, it is possible that the Earth's land masses will return to a Pangaea-like unified state. Okay, so you read the paragraph, and then you ask a simple question, okay? So A, read the paragraph. B, ask, what is this paragraph about? C, answer in a full sentence. Okay. So uh, what was this paragraph about that I just read? Okay, the one that we just read. So Pangaea separates into uh, two parts, Laurasia Gondwana. Laurasia consisted of what is today North America, Asia, and Europe, whilst Gondwana is comprised of modern-day South America, Africa, Australia. These supercontinents eventually split further. So what is it about? Okay, Yextan says it's about the separation of continents into many, right? Okay, good. So now, D, Find the closest match to your answer, okay? So this is about the separation of a few continents into many smaller continents. Let's find the closest match to our answer, okay? Is it violent eruptions, magma? No. Destruction of Pompeii? No. Two continents become many? That looks kind of good. Fossil evidence? Adjacent continents, no, because that just means beside. This one still looks better. An intuitive notion, the ring of fire, the invisible threat. 
Gunwana comes together? No. A hypothesis of unity and disunity? No. A mechanism to match the theory is found? Yeah, I think the closest one is two continents become many. Okay? So it's not a hypothesis because this isn't a theory. This is. Okay? Hypothesis means a theory or an idea, but this isn't a theory or idea. This is happening. So two continents become many. Three is the closest match. It doesn't in the paragraph say anywhere that there's an idea that this is what happens. Okay, so be careful. You can't add your own information that's not in the paragraph. Let's try one more. Okay, let's try one more. All right. So uh, for Dov's paragraph B was 10. So review your uh, book for Dov's for that. Okay, you shouldn't have been thinking 10 for that. Let's do uh, D. Okay. Um, so here we go. The evidence for continental drift is plentiful. The most common evidence is the discovery of the same type of dinosaurs in extremely different locations. The same type of dinosaur fossils will be found in northeastern parts of South America as well as northwestern parts of Africa. The logical explanation for phenomena such as this is that at one time these parts of the world were not only connected but adjacent. Uh, what is this paragraph about? So what is paragraph D about? You should get this one pretty quick in your own words. So again, I read the paragraph and I, it's about fossils, Yextum, but it's more than that. It's about fossils proving continental drift, right? So fossil proof for continental drift, right? So it says that you're finding the same kind of dinosaur bones on different continents is a hint or it's proof of continental drift. Yeah, so Ferdov says evidence that these continents were adjacent. So which of these is the closest to that? Okay, which of these is the closest? What do you think? Yeah, yeah, then I agree. It's fossil evidence. Okay, so that paragraph is about fossil evidence. That's the topic. All right. Now, uh, one more point. So you keep going like this, and it makes a lot of sense. Believe me. Um, now, one more point. Okay. So, and this is important, students. Make sure to do a very good job with list of headings questions because they will help you with other questions for that passage. Okay, let me show you what I mean. So here, if I go to the end, I have true, false, not given. And here it says it took over 350 years for the theory. Now, if I did a good job on the list of headings, then I can recognize very quickly where these pieces of information are coming from because I know what each paragraph is about. So when you do a good job on the list of headings and you're confident, you're like, okay, I'm sure that that's the correct topic for each paragraph, then it becomes very quick to do these kinds of questions where you're giving true, false, not given, or you're completing these sentence endings because you remember that, okay, plate tectonics results in mountains and volcanoes. Hey, I remember that, I'm not sure which one it was, but paragraph G is about volcanoes because paragraph G is where I uh, put violent eruptions, magma, lava, and new islands. Does that make sense? Does that make sense? So it, does it make sense how list of headings is a very important question because you can use that to be confident and accurate with the other questions in the passage? 
because you know the structure of the essay, right? So you want to do a really good job on those list of headings questions. I get very worried when I see students making a lot of mistakes in list of headings because for me as a teacher, as the examiner, if a student makes a lot of mistakes in the list of headings, it tells me that they didn't understand the passage nearly as well as they should, okay? They don't really know what those paragraphs are about. So that was a good question, okay? That was a great question. Uh, members, I'm going to stop there for today. That's lots of information, and I know there were some other questions as well I, that I didn't get to today. Uh, I'll do another Q&A session when I come back in early February on the 6th, um, so we'll hold one during that week maybe to get to those. Or you can also send me some emails, and I will happily answer as many questions as possible for you so that you feel confident knowing what and how. All right, so that's it for today's Q&A class. Those are some really good questions about the writing and reading parts. Um, and uh, coming up in uh, 30 minutes, I will host one more class for uh, speaking part three, okay? So speaking part three, uh, coming up in 30 minutes. Again, if I didn't get to your questions, members, or I missed some of them and you thought they're really important, save them for the next Q&A class or just send me an email and I will gladly answer them when I have a bit of time. That's all for this class in 30 minutes. Everybody can chat class coming up. For all of our viewers, check us out at aehelp.com for academic IELTS, G-I-E-L-T-S help.com for general. Join our premium courses. See you shortly. Bye for now.